Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us this morning, especially braving the snow. Um, I'm Dr. Monica Saavedra, the Director of Health and Human Services here for the Village of Hoffman Estates, uh, and we provide mental health and physical health services for the community. We're really excited today to welcome you to this great workshop that we're going to have this morning, Health and Wellness for the New Year and a Lifetime, and with our wonderful speaker, Dr. George Zarabelsky. Um, Dr. Zarabelsky is a board-certified physician practicing gastroenterology and hepatology out of Hoffman Estates, Illinois, since 1993. He specializes in digestive, nutritional, and liver health. And he founded the Digestive Disorders and Liver Center in 1993, and in 2018, the Nutritional, Digestive, and Liver Health Matters Institute. Say that three times. <laughs> All right. So Dr. Zarabelsky focuses on a preventative health philosophy towards individualizing strategies to help his patients maintain health and manage weight naturally using cutting edge scientific nutritional and lifestyle approaches. He completed his fellowship in digestive and liver disease and nutrition at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill after finishing a residency in internal medicine at the University of Illinois in Chicago. He earned his medical degree and a master's of science degree in chemistry from the University of Illinois in Chicago. He received his bachelor's of arts degree with honors in chemistry from Loyola University. He published his healthful lifestyle book, Crude Fuel Monkey Food Diet, in December 2018, available through Amazon.com, and you can certainly look at it later on on our table. Um, today we're excited to have Dr. Zarabelsky share his knowledge with us and, um, in order to have a health and wellness for the new year and a lifetime. So please help me welcome Dr. George Zarabelsky. I'm out of my sick care role, which is what I usually do. Uh, when um, I practice medicine. I'm troubleshooting, trying to help people get better because they've uh, gotten ill or have had, had problems. So I've tried to uh, work into a health and wellness role and because uh, I believe that uh, we should have a caring health uh, system that uh, keeps us from getting ill so that uh, we don't um, have to uh, suffer in life and uh, uh, have many expenses related to our health. And a lot of the ideas I'm going to present um, are easy to implement uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. But before we get started uh, um, on, on this, um, Dr. Saavedra already went through this um, about me, and that's my book, in case you're interested. So there's the medical disclaimer for all the uh, attorney types that uh, are out there. You know, this is not meant to provide medical advice or treatment or, you know, you shouldn't substitute for anything, uh, any advice your doctor uh, gives you. So follow up with your doctor if you want, uh, um, you know, medical advice or treatment. In any case, um, I have no co uh, commercial conflicts of interest to report. I'm not here for any industry that is um, um, out there uh, looking to profit financially off of uh, what I'm presenting. So uh, I want to ask a question to the general audience. Who wants cures for cancers? Uh, let's have you all raise your hands if you believe that. Okay. Well, the next question is, who should develop cancer to help scientists find cancer cures? Okay, so obviously, um, you know, we all want these um, treatments for these health conditions, but if we uh, get into a state where we don't get these health conditions, we're not going to be dependent on the industry to try to um, rescue us uh, from these health conditions. So consequently, um, Desmond Tutu once said, instead of pulling, uh, drowning people out of a river, we should go upstream and find out why they're in a river drowning in the first place. So uh, we're going to start off with a definition of what is health. Well, health is transparent physical and behavioral functioning with life actions flowing smoothly without alarming body signals or commercial dependency. Now, what does that mean? That means as you cruise around through life on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't feel your body. It doesn't talk to you and alert you that your hip hurts or your back hurts or your tummy is queasy or you have thoughts that are intrusive, you're just working transparently to accomplish tasks at hand. So your life actions are 
flowing smoothly and so you don't have alarming signals and you don't have to pay for it. So um, health is not being dependent on commercial products to keep you functioning. So you're actually doing it naturally. So healthy is beautiful and sexy. So if you really want to look good, the key is to be healthy, to work on your health. Um, you know, there's um, a lot about having good physical and mental health uh, with respect to making you more attractive uh, across the board. So what is disease? It's an adverse health condition having a disturbance of normal body structure or function. So as you're cruising along, if things are not working or if you need medicines to uh, put things back into balance, uh, well, things aren't working like they should be working. So consequently, um, that would uh, fit into that uh, definition. What are the disease costs? Well, you're paying uh, uh, expenses, and time, so our lifetime is limited. And when you are um, uh, unhealthy, you're not feeling well, uh, you're, 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 you're trying to, to get back to a state where you're functioning transparently. So consequently, you're gonna be spending money. And everybody pays, it's not you, it's uh, everybody pays. Society pays, you pay, family pays. Um, in many different ways, not only monetary, but suffering. And you lose your independence because now you have to go to doctor visits, you have to uh, stay home because you can't engage in certain activities. And what's more is as you get um, unhealthy, as you have conditions, health conditions, you start to accelerate your aging because your body tissues break down. So. Um, uh, it, there's a lot of cost to diseases. If you're healthy, health reduces life costs. It's a lot less expensive to be healthy. So ultimately, who's responsible to maintain your own health? Your health is really your responsibility. It's, it's not society's responsibility, it's not uh, your neighbors, it's not your family's, it's your responsibility. So if you're a responsible adult, you agree, agreeably take charge of your own health. So you have to be accountable for your own health. You have to actively participate in preserving and defending your own health. Maintaining health requires commitment and effort. It just doesn't happen. You know, you can't expect your body to work for you if you don't work for your body. You have to actually do things to make yourself uh, healthy. So. What is disease prevention? It, it's acting to stop adverse health conditions from developing. So di disease prevention is actually uh, doing the kinds of things that uh, keep you from getting sick. So preventative health strategies safeguard and defend your own health. And these include actions that secure and maintain the health you have in your possession and avoidance of actions that deteriorate your health. So that means basically that uh, you have to engage in a series of behaviors that keep you from getting sick and you have to avoid the kinds of behaviors that'll make you sick. Um, and these include common things as you know, uh, smoking cigarettes, driving too fast, um, uh, not getting enough rest, uh, so maintaining health costs less than regaining health and invests lifetime for the future. So if you're working on your health, um, then you're going to be around longer and you're going to be able to accomplish more in your life. And we'll get to some of this in a little bit. So true preventative health strategies contrast with secondary health interventions um, that are out there uh, and societally sanctioned today, which are aimed to detect, reverse, or slow the progression of established diseases. So these preventative health strategies, uh, such as colonoscopy, we're looking for polyps. You already got the tumor. We're looking for cancer. You already got it. Um, 
mammograms, they're looking for breast cancer, you know, you already developed it. Um, prostate screenings, looking for prostate cancer. And these all um, um, are already past the stage of not getting the cancer. So what do we actually need as humans to exist in our lifetime? The fundamental needs for existence are basically this uh, seven, uh, these seven points here, air. Without air, you die, a few minutes, that's it. End of life. Water, a few days. No water, you know, put yourself in a desert. All right, not gonna be around too long. Fuel, fuel is your food. Few weeks, don't eat for a few weeks, see what happens. It's kind of rough on your body. Movement, so if you don't move your body while you're alive, you develop pressure ulcers within hours. Okay, this happens in people in hospitals that aren't moving. They get sores on their bodies from tissues deteriorating. Rest. If you don't rest, your brain starts to go haywire. You develop hallucinations after a few days of sleep deprivation. Toxicity avoidance. You, you, when you get body damages, it compromises health and survival. So you have to avoid the kinds of things that cause toxicity to your body so your body isn't having to repair itself um, to survive. And finally, connection. You need to connect to other people. Human isolation causes mental distress, hallucinations, time distortion within months. So people who are isolated from others start to develop mental health issues. Um, so basically, these are the main seven components uh, for you to exist on this earth. Now Maslow was a, a behavioral psychologist and he developed a, a hierarchy of needs in the 70s. He, he, he figured out that um, there's a certain um, a hierarchy of uh, different things that we as human beings need in order to um, uh, live in this world. And it all starts with physiologic and safety. We need to stay alive, right? If you don't take care of your, your, your basics, your, your basic needs, uh, if you don't stay safe, you don't stay alive. You can't get up to the pinnacle of existence in your life. Uh, then the next component is you need to feel connected. These are psychological needs. You, you need to be loved. You need to have a sense of belonging. You need to feel good about yourself. And eventually you get self-actualized. You transcend life. You maximize you, your humanness and individuality. You reach a pinnacle, some self-fulfillment needs that are the pinnacle of your success as a human being. Be all that you can be, right? And uh, that's really where we're going. Unfortunately, there are many social problems that uh, interfere with our capability to become a great uh, solo pianist or a writer or a philosopher. If you don't have enough food, if you're in poverty, if, if, you, know, if you have all these uh, basics that aren't and that are not met, it's very difficult for you to actually make it up to the top, the pinnacle, to be all you can be. Some make it, many don't. So our human lifetime is limited. We have only so much time on this earth to get to where we want to go and be all that we can be. And if you're healthy, it'll maximize your lifetime to get to be where you want to be. Uh, having life goals also gives life purpose and direction. So if you're existing on this earth, you have to think about where you're going. Because if you're just floundering around, you're wasting time. You're not taking advantage of the short existence that you have on this world uh, to get to be all that you can be. So, and also, if you have a life purpose and direction, it increases your lifespan and life satisfaction. If you don't have somewhere to go, somewhere to be, um, your life is shorter, you're less healthy, you get distracted, you get pulled away into directions that are unhealthy. Intelligent life goals aim for healthy. So in the context of having life goals, you have to think about how you're going to become a healthy person. So New Year's resolutions are life goals, aren't they? You decide you're gonna get somewhere and you, you hope to work at it. 
in our life journeys, we have goals and ambition, and we have our state of existence where we actually are. And what separates the goals and state of existence is stress. This is our journey. We want to get there. Okay, so we want to have uh, the capability of realizing our goals and ambition. We need to get the right path for our capabilities, our strengths as human beings. Stress is challenge to our survival. When you're stressed out, you're not a healthy person. You start to make mistakes in life, choose poor, uh, poorer. Go frustration and failures. If you don't get to where you want to go to, it might predispose you to feeling guilty. I did something wrong. And shame. I'm a bad person because you didn't realize your goals. And these increase stress, which predisposes to health deterioration. So the more stressed you are, challenges your survival more, your health deteriorates. So stress, goal frustration and failures, and ignorance, not knowing your understanding. You just don't know. Increase your vulnerability to quit, fix, run away, escape, and rescue, bail out, exploitation. There's a lot of snake oil in the world. There's a lot of people and uh, businesses that are selling solutions um, that, that take advantage of your vulnerabilities. Stress causes cancer to develop, grow, and spread. So managing stress is definitely desirable if you want to reduce your cancer risks. So how do you maximize your existence and life goal achievements? You have to create realistic, positive, constructive, and healthy goals. Realistic for you. I want to go to the moon. Well, it's not going to happen, okay? Positive. I want to do something. I want to be healthy instead of negative. I'm not going to do that, okay? Not going to do that. It's more stressful than I'm going to be that. Constructive. I'm going to build something. I'm going to leave some legacy of my ideas or my thoughts and healthy goals, because you want to stay healthy to be able to maximize your goals. You have to design sensible goal strategies that make sense. Even if you have to do it in short little steps, it doesn't matter. Make it happen through real uh, sensible goals. You have to identify your true basic needs. You have to rank your needs over your wants, okay? Because as Maslow said, you have to know your basic needs. Budget your resources, time, energy, finances to satisfy needs and goals. Plan and plan for setbacks. First, fill your basic needs. Execute your goal strategies. You have to act. Limit your distractions and sustain goal-directed efforts. And then repeat the process when you become successful. You're going to encounter setbacks. Tough it out. Persevere. Be resilient. Bounce back. Overcome obstacles creatively. Be flexible. Redefine your goals and strategies as necessary to finish successfully. Goal failures are missed attempts providing opportunities to learn and gain experience, allowing design of better goals and strategies. So you take them as a learning experience. Limitations to goal achievement. Not enough time, not enough energy, not enough money, which is time and energy because you've got to work for your money. And available resources. If you're in the middle of some primitive place, uh, it's very hard to think about being a conductor of an orchestra, correct? You're missing things. Human lives are time and energy limited. So budgeting your personal time and energies intelligently increases opportunities for life goal accomplishments. Regularly exceeding personal time and energy limitations, on the other hand, produces burnout to deteriorate your health. So if you don't heed your time and energy limitations as a human being, you get burned out. You do too much. You live what I call a maxed survival, okay? You're just cruising along, doing as much as you can to sustain what you have, um, but then you're losing your health. So what are some deterrents to goal achievement? You plan poorly, defective planning. You got this information. You were, uh, you were, um, uh, you were uh, going according to uh, biases, nefarious intentions uh, from uh, various entities, you're derailed. You have negative influences from family, friends, associates. They say, you can't do that. Oh, you'll never make it. You're just not going to make it. Distractions, social media, texting. You know, um, the average person blows off three and a half hours daily on non-occupational activities. This is just hanging around. Uh, detours, you, you have disordered priorities. I'm going to do this instead. 
denial. I don't really, you don't recognize need. I don't really need to do that. You get in debt. Dwindling resources, debility. These are health behavior driven. You become disabled. You get disease. You get old, decrepitude, and finally you die. And then, obviously, death is the final straw that keeps you from achieving your goals. <laughs> Factors challenging a healthful existence. Out there, abundance. We got too many choices, they confuse us. It's both a blessing and a cure. Conveniences, easier is enticing. I'm gonna take the shortcut. Indulgences, fun and comfort are seductive, lack of time and energy commitment. Commercial resource pressures, consumers must, must consume. So you have a lot of com uh, com commercial pressures out there telling you what to do, confusing your needs and wants. And behavior pitfalls, behavior pitfalls, you start you're into abuse. You overdo good or bad actions. You abuse yourself. You abuse yourself working out 12 hours a day, okay? Uh, neglect. You just don't do it. Absent or insufficient care. You just don't do as much as you need or wrong care. I'm thirsty. I'm going to have a sports drink. I'm thirsty. I'm going to have 12 pack of beer. Is a prolonged survival or a long, durable, and productive life more desirable? Healthful life goal is to have longevity, live long, with a long health span. What is aging? That's the number one cause of death and disability in us, isn't it? Because when you get older, uh, you're, that, you know, you, chances are you're going to be disabled or you're going to die. Aging is a time-driven process of growing older biologically and experiencing age, progressive physical and mental decline. It's genetically determined but a lot of it is also behaviorally driven and environmentally modulated. And these determine your genetic actions. It turns on and turns off genes. So if you have uh, good behaviors and uh, environmental exposures, your genes are going to work better for you. What are the golden years? You've worked hard. You want to exist when you're older um, doing things that are for you. You don't want to have the golden years. You saved all your gold and then you pay it out to the industry, right? To fix you. Now you run into the doctor, you're spending your money, the hospitals, on medicines. You're, 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 you know, the number one cause of, of, of people going bankrupt when they're older is, is medical bills. So what are factors infecting, uh, impacting your health span? Genetics inherited and epigenetic gene activation. So inherited is what you get from your parents. Epigenetic is what turns your genes on and off. Mechanical wear and tear stresses. The more you beat up your body, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the shorter your health span. Chemical stresses, smoking, drinking, um, various doing substances. Metabolic stresses. You eat too much. You eat the wrong things. Damage and injury repair and healing. Once you beat yourself up, your body has to repair itself. And when it's repairing itself, it's causing more damage, scarring. You know, you start to get uh, body parts that are starting to break down. And luck. You've got to have a little bit of luck to have a good health span. But chance favors the prepared and ready. Having health understanding and awareness protects your survival. You've got to know what to do, right? Human survival is energy driven. This is the most, one of the most important ideas. We're embedded in a, a world that has to do with a lot of energy flow. Our bodies are energized as biological beings. We exist because we have energy. Uh, once we die, the uh, life force, the energy force leaves us and then we just uh, scatter into powder. Our molecules separate out. There's no energy holding us together. So the brain manages human survival. Your brain is the computer up at the at top of your head that uh, keeps you alive. And one of the most important aspects of staying alive is to feed and breed. We feed and breed instinctively to survive. Those are our primal instincts in our brain stem. Okay, you're gonna feed. Okay, you're gonna do anything you can to feed. So it's much easier to uh, resist bad food when you're well fed than to resist bad food when you're starved, right? You're gonna eat anything to survive. 
and we need to breed. That's a, a, a very powerful driving force for our existence. And it comes in, in many different forms. It comes in everything from our um, appearances, you know, it, it drives vanity, it drives pornography, it drives everything out there. Um, and so this appeals to our primal instincts. What are instincts? They're programmed behavioral routines that are determined genetically or developed through life experiences and learning. So we have these instincts that are built in for you to survive, even if you don't use your brain. And then there are other instincts we develop through learning. And those instincts that we develop through learning can be hijacked. Systems, commercial systems that look to generate revenues look to hijack your learned instincts. Brain information processing <clears throat> um, it has to do a lot with energy. So we have specialized receptors and sense organs or lining blood vessels, body cavities in the gut that detect various forms of energy, light, sound, chemical, mechanical, or thermal. So we get bombarded with sound, that's energy. We see things, that's light energy. We feel things that touch us. Chemical energy is uh, what we feel in our gut or in our inflammatory state. These specialized receptors transmit the collected energy information to the brain chemically or through nerves, and then the brain decodes the received information and dispatches commands immediately for the body to execute or stores the information for later use. And we start building a series of instincts based on what we've experienced from an energy standpoint. Greed, this is one of the it's the predacious desire for amassing, amassing personal surplus and excess. It's never enough. This is a human trait. <coughs> Greed distinguishes between how humans and animals fulfill basic feed and breed survival instincts. We want more. Oh, yeah, we're going to accumulate because feeding and breeding with greed tilts survival odds to favor the greedy, or does it? So if you're eating three pizzas a day and a bunch of hamburgers and you're really stimulated and you want more uh, two-for-ones, uh, is it really going to make you live longer? It's, it's a fooler. The brain, we have this thing called a reward system in our brain, and there's a chemical in there that controls it. It's called dopamine. It's a brain neurotransmitter that governs behavioral motivation. When dopamine goes out of whack, we behave like dopes. So humans run toward pleasure. Makes sense, right? You run into the arms of a loved one. You run toward something tasty. And we run from pain and suffering. You run from fire. You run from bad experiences. And both of these, dopamine gets you toward pleasure. And dopamine raises to get you away from pain. And just thinking about engaging in pleasurable activities or escaping from pain motivates you to act. Dopamine goes up. So when you're thinking about, I'm going to get that pizza. Oh, that tastes so good. I'm going to have some beers. I'm going to do this. Your dopamine is shooting in there, okay? And it's been trained through your life experiences, your instincts. So substances that potently stimulate the brain reward system are sugar and fat. They drive our primal survival urges. So many, many years ago, sugar and fat kept us alive. It was, they were calorically dense. So you had these, the capability to detect uh, things that were rich in fat and sweet. So you live longer because uh, eating, uh, you know, bark just didn't do it for you. But finding something sweet is going to get you around. Now, unfortunately, we also have heroin, cocaine, alcohol, and nicotine that stimulate that same brain reward system. And you could imagine. We start to adapt as we hit our brain reward system, it desensitizes. So all of a sudden, it doesn't have the same um, action as it did. And we need more to sustain it, right? We need to eat more. We need to do more heroin, cocaine, alcohol, tobacco. Um, and when you're away from it, you don't do it, all of a sudden you're suffering. And you know the fix. You go back and do some more, right? Dopamine makes you behave like dopes. Needs, wants, and craves drive human decision-making. So your decision-making is driven by basic needs, your wants. Uh, I want that special $6,000 purse because I'm going to look much better than a $12 purse, right? Uh, craves, I really want to have some chocolate, really bad, because you know, I want to have some sweets because you've hit that brain reward system. And it remembers, it motivates you to act toward it. 
Commercial industries exist to supply human needs, wants, and craves, right? What's the point of having a commercial system if, you know, nobody wants anything? I don't want it. No, you know, nobody's going to want to buy anything, okay? You need to have, uh, you know, needs, wants, or craves that you're supplying. Human needs, wants, and craves are predictable. Commercial systems exploit the human feed, breed, and greed instincts and pleasure reward and pain avoidance programming to generate in industry revenues. They know how you work. All those psychologists that are not cons uh, consulting to improve your behavioral health are probably working for industries um, thinking of ways to get you to buy things. Runaway escapes. We run away from pain. Uh, are you feeling distressed? We can give you relief. You know, are you having a tough time in your life? We can give you relief. Runaway escapes, okay? My day is so difficult and painful today, I need some sweets. I need some sugar, I need a donut, you know? To really get you to boost up that brain reward system. Uh, runaway escapes. Coupon deals and special offer incentives appeal to greed. Two for one, three for one, six for one. On sale today only. Run, get it. It's going to be out of stock. And eventually, I created this term, addictification. There, we get into a mode of addictification where there's behavioral entrapment in repetitive money spending routines, purchasing commercial products or services of convenience, luxury, or pleasure to obtain happiness or reduce stress. We get addictified. You know, we are, um, we are buying things, we're going for that donut every day and a cup of coffee and because it makes our life better, or does it? Addictification products and services principally target primal urges and survival instincts through sensory stimulation, feeding, breeding, greed, pleasure, reward, and pain avoidance to feel good. You get addictified. Modern Western societies create human-made systems that command and challenge natural human functioning and existence, right? Nothing's easy in life. Human deficiencies and failures, you don't make it, are commercial opportunities for industries to profit selling rescue bailouts. You didn't make it, sorry, but here we got this for you. We're going to help make your day better. Financial incentives promoting healthy behaviors that sever human dependence on commercial industries are non-existent. They don't exist, right? What's the point? If you don't go for, uh, to industry, you don't generate any revenues. Not, what's the point of industry? There's a lot of taxes to pay. There's a lot of overhead. And that's the least amount to exist. Dietary and lifestyle choices affect your health span. Processed food and beverage products are designed deliberately to maximize shelf life and drive consumption, right? Consumption drives commercial industry revenues. Eat more, buy more. And the big fish must feed on many little fish to survive. They gotta get their profits up, otherwise investors pull back their investments. Stocks crash. They gotta figure out a way to get you buy-in. Poor dietary and lifestyle choices compromise health to require healthcare and industry rescue bailouts. When your health gets messed up through addictification, through poor behaviors, your health messes up. You need help. Help me. I need rescue care. Healthcare industry rescue bailouts often antidote toxic health behaviors. So if you didn't do those things, going back to health prevention, if you were acting to stay healthy and avoiding things that didn't make you sick, chances are you wouldn't get sick and you wouldn't need healthcare industry help, which is just antidoting toxic health behaviors. How many people are still smoking when they have respiratory illness going to the doctor? Hey, you need to stop smoking. Oh, doc, I can't do it, man, you know? So these are the kinds of things that the uh, healthcare industry thrives on are failures. Excessive reliance on healthcare industry rescue bailouts generates expensive consumer dependency, right? You gotta go to the healthcare industry for help now all the time. I created this term, dependification. Developing costly reliance on commercial industries to meet personal health and survival needs. So, remember the definition of health? I said, 
without commercial dependence. So are you really healthy if you have a stack of medicines, if you're running for healthcare items all the time? Are you really healthy or are you dependified? Living is simple. Human biological functioning integrates best within natural systems. We evolved. Our bodies evolved to embed in a natural world. We were evolving slower than the industry is evolving to, uh, to provide us with the kinds of things that are appealing to our primal urges. Trust life basics and what Mother Nature made to optimize health and maximize longevity and health span. Going back to the fundamental human needs for existence, air, water, fuel, movement, rest, toxicity, avoidance, and connection. Let's look at air. Air should be smoke and pollution free. Pollution free is ideal, but it should be smoke free. You know, think about it. If this room filled up with smoke, we'd all get out of here instantly. So what's the point of putting smoke in your lungs? When you put smoke and other toxic substances in your lungs, you start to deteriorate them. Your lungs contain large surface areas to extract vital oxygen from air and eliminate carbon dioxide and other gaseous wastes generated during body energy producing and detoxification processes, right? You need, this, you, need air, you need air to stay alive. It, need to go, it needs to go into your body. It needs to get rid of crap from your body that has been produced existing. Smoke, air pollution, and chemical vapors and fumes damage and obliterate very delicate lung air filtering membranes to deteriorate air exchange capabilities and compromise your health. So enough said about that. Need clean air. Water. H2O, pure and simple, without additives. It's H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, that's it. The human body composition is 50 to 70% water by weight. It's not beer, it's not juice, it's not flavored water, it's water, H2O. What does water do? It fills out and shapes body cells, membranes, organs, tissues, and tubes, gives us our shape. It serves as the principal medium where body, cell, and tissue chemical and biological reactions occur. If you didn't have water, all these chemical reactions couldn't happen. It mixes with food, enzymes, and other contents like bacteria in the gut to allow nutrient digestion to proceed. It carries body waste and toxins out in urine and feces, and it evaporates the sweat to cool the body. Water, H2O. Water needs equal water losses. So our daily water needs estimated. Now this is for healthy average size adults. Believe it or not, 154 pounds. Living in temperate climates performing non-strenuous activities. We lose some in urine, um, half to one and a half milliliters per kilogram per hour. And this is the range, milliliters, and we'll, get, we'll, we'll convert it to ounces. Sweat. All right, a cup is approximately 300, so three to 600 milliliters per day. Stool, 200 milliliters per day, a little less than a cup in breath, three to 500 milliliters per day. So, so the total range is 1640, 3820, approximately 57 to 133 ounces for this 70 kilogram, 154 pound individual living in temperate climates performing non-strenuous activities. So your water needs can be uh, reduced about one ounce of water per kilogram. Thirst guides body water needs reliably. When you're thirsty, it means you need water. Commercial beverage industries routinely hijack human thirst for water drives to generate in industry revenues, right? Industries want to quench your thirst. Industries want to hijack your thirst to sell you things. Water needs under special circumstances. Certainly, if it's hotter outside, you need more water. If you're strenuously active, you might lose four quarts of water in an hour. If you have heart and liver conditions, it reduces your water needs because you can't eliminate water. Kidney conditions generally reduce, sometimes can increase water needs. Some people urinate excessively. Fuel, that's the next point. Provides the body energy to live and execute life actions. Fuel is food. Healthier food equals healthier living. Healthy human survival depends on the body receiving and utilizing energy safely and efficiently. This is all about energy. Einstein's mass energy equivalence formula, you might have seen this equals mc squared, says that one gram of matter, the size of a sugar cube, 
if you released all the energy at one time would blow up Chicago, 21 kilotons of energy. So our body has the capability to unravel energy. We need energy delivery uh, has to be paced and synchronized to our needs. So the body requires timely food energy deliveries. If we uh, supply energy overly rapidly, excessively, or frequently, we overwhelm our capacities to assimilate energy safely, leading to metabolic injuries to our cells. We store excess energy as fat, and we generate toxic substances, cholesterol, triglycerides, react other chemically reactive substances. And it activates stress signaling, like high blood pressure, diabetes. We have health conditions. Our human digestive tract is 30 to 35 feet long with cereal compartments. Each gut compartment is a digestive department performing specific nutrient-driven tasks. And then we have accessory organs like the liver, pancreas, salivary glands that connect to help us digest food. We need to use all 30, 35 feet of gut. Okay, there's a reason for that. Because it promotes our existence. Our gut functions to dismantle, process, and absorb foods to supply us with body and energy but it also serves immune surveillance and modulatory roles. So anything that goes through you stimulates your immune system. For individuals that have autoimmune disorders, a lot of things that you eat could activate your immune response. It's very potent because you're sampling the environment chemically. And it also houses vast populations of symbiotic microbes impacting physical and behavioral health. What does that mean? We have these bacteria, the microbiome, and I'll talk about that. We have this bacteria and it's where we're spaceships carrying around bacteria that work in our health. And it also temporarily stores and expels digestive waste and body toxins and species. So eventually things go out our urinary system or gut that, that have accumulated or have been poisoning us. The gut is actually the little brain because it possesses many of the same chemicals, neurotransmitters as the brain. It monitors and biologically responds to all chemical, mechanical, biological properties of passing and contained gut contents. Everything inside um, activates your gut. Your gut responds to it, and it communicates gut immune and digestive activities to integrate gut, brain, and body functioning. So as you put things in, it talks to the rest of the body. Your gut learns certain things, and then it uh, teaches the rest of your body what's going on. And then when you're re-exposed to certain things, you can activate things, you know, uh, uh, problems that you might have from, from prior exposures. The gut microbiome, just very briefly, is 10 to 100 trillion microbes that inhabit your colon. We only have 4 trillion native human cells. We're outnumbered. 95% of that is bacteria with thousands of different species and strains. There's a little bit of yeast, fungi, and other primitive organisms that they don't have a handle on. And then there are trillions of viruses that infect those organisms. So you can imagine it's a world inside of us that we don't know. And they feed on the nutrients and gut mucus slime and, and shed uh, cellular debris passing down the gut. They provide us with vitamins and energy. They modulate our immune development and immunity. They affect our physical and behavioral health. They also metabolize drugs and other chemicals that pass down the gut. They're a, a machine, they work for us. If you wanna have a healthy microbiome, you gotta feed it healthy things. They feed on fruits, vegetables, other things that make you healthy too. They get poisoned by the chemicals and foods that, uh, that are uh, within foods today. At food preservatives are antibiotics. They kill off various populations of susceptible organisms. So mindful eating, starting with this, the stomach has no teeth, so chew your food thoroughly. Your mouth is only this far from your brain. If you don't spend time chewing your food, your brain doesn't know what went through you until maybe the gut later can figure it out. So you need to take time chewing your food to expose the nerves in your mouth to the chemicals, the energy chemicals that you have that are talking to your brain. So how do you eat correctly? Load the mouth with enough food to chew comfortably. You don't jam food in your mouth. You have to be able to chew with the mouth closed. Chew completely until what's in your mouth is dissolved into a liquid or paste. Swallow mouth contents entirely, and then reload the mouth with more food after swallowing. 
Practice chewing a few mouthfuls with eyes closed to eat more mindfully. So if you close your eyes a few times and chew, you will uh, uh, get rid of the distractions around you. We have primacy of senses. We first see dangers, then we hear them, and then we taste them, right? So if you close your eyes, all of a sudden you start focusing into what's happening inside of you. So practice that a few times. You'll learn how to eat in, less than two, uh, in more than two minutes. Well, okay, we need to know what, what are, how do we energize? Well, uh, one important concept is the calorie. It measures um, food energy content. And scientifically, it's the energy necessary to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. Well, the energy in foods actually, one gram raises, is actually 4,000 of these little calories. So one gram provides 4,000 calories of energy, but we just call it calorie. We don't call it 4,000 calories because you'd be like, oh my God, I'm eating 4,000 calories. So carbohydrates and sugar provide one gram of, uh, one gram provides one, uh, four calories of energy, proteins, amino acids, one gram, four calories, fats, one gram, nine calories, more than twice the amount. Alcohol provides seven calories of energy, calories. One standard drink, which is one and a half ounces, 40% spirits, 12 and a half, uh, 12 ounce, 5% alcohol beer, five ounces of 12% wine, supplies 14 grams of alcohol. You're getting 98 calories just from one drink. So some of you that have weight problems, geez, Maybe if you cut out certain things, and if you drink alcohol, that might work for you. Carbohydrates, what do they do? They provide and store energy, but they also have a lot of other roles in cells. They're part of the plant walls, but basically they provide and store energy, and they're composed of only three molecules, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, in repeating subunits, simple sugars have five or six of these subunits, um, and it may pair with another ring, and this is like glucose, lactose. Um, complex starches link three more of these sugars. Resistant starches are starches that can't be broken down because we don't have the enzymes to break them down. <coughs> they metabolize cleanly with oxygen to generate energy and produce carbon dioxide and water. So you blow off the carbon dioxide and, and you, and you uh, lose the water through sweat and various other means. Proteins are the workhorses in our bodies. They're large, complex molecules that are uh, made up of thousands of uh, smaller units called amino acids. They do all kinds of things that are structural, functional, regulatory in our, in our body. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Humans can build, and they have a characteristic structure. Humans can build all proteins from only 20 amino acids. 11 of these amino acids are non-essential since the body can synthesize these. Nine are essential. You have to get them from outside food sources. Food protein quality varies in the proportion and composition of essential and non-essential amino acids. Albumin, egg albumin, you can imagine, in a growing chick, is the best, highest quality um, protein you can get. Fats, they provide and store concentrated energy. Again, they're mainly composed of carbon and hydrogen that are bonded in various ways to each other. Um, and um, saturated and unsaturated have to do with how carbons bond to each other. Uh, particularly um, for uh, out there for the industry, omegas, fish oils, they're just omega-3s and omega-6 fatty acids, which are essential since the body can't make those fats. You can make all the other fats from protein can be broken down into fat, sugar can be broken down into fat. Omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acid ratios affect your immune and inflammatory balance. If you have too much omega-6, you're more likely to be in an inflammatory state. You have to balance that out. So eating healthy fats uh, keeps your inflammatory state down. Nutrient composition and parceling within foods determine how readily the digestive system releases and absorbs the food nutrients. So food processing breaks down whole foods to separate whole food nutrients. Refined nutrients are concentrated and variously combined to create food products that digest with less gut work to absorb rapidly into the bloodstream from the gut. So the nutrient composition parceling makes a difference. 
Whole foods are different from processed foods. Processed foods have already been digested. You don't need your gut, right? You just slurp them up, up high. It never uses 30, 35 feet of gut, never feeds your microbiome. You absorb it up high, you overwhelmed your um, energy needs. Now you got all this energy floating around. It's causing damage to your system. Caloric density is something, uh, calories per gram weight of food that's very important. Whole foods naturally contain a lot of water to lower caloric densities, less than or equal to two kilo calories per gram. Well, fruit and vegetables are 85 to 95 percent water. Whole grains, 12 to 14, fresh raw meats and fish, 70, 90 percent. You have to beat up whole foods with your gut, with your teeth to release the energy. So sometimes people say, I don't eat fruit because it affects my diabetes. Well, one piece of bread hammers your system with calories and energy, whereas an apple, you have to you have to really beat it up. It takes hours for the energy to go in and you lose some of that energy processing that uh, apple. So food processing extracts water from whole foods to concentrate nutrients and raise caloric densities, often to greater than four kilocalories per gram. So you can calorie this. Look at the calories per food serving size and divide it by the weight and you can get the caloric density. Denser foods provide energy too quickly for your system to work on that energy and assimilate it correctly. Crude fuels, which are foods that are unprocessed versus processed foods, crude fuels are whole natural foods. They're energy poor and nutrient rich. Whereas artificially generated, the processed foods are artificially generated, they're energy rich and nutrient poor. There's really only four main ingredients in processed foods, flour, sugar, fat, and salt. And then, oh, they took out all these vitamins. Let's put some vitamins back in artificially. Mechanical and chemical food processing breaks down complex uh, whole food nutrients into simpler forms. It decreases digestive work energies required to release food nutrients. So things are broken down. Your gut doesn't have to work to extract the nutrients and calories. And it also reduces gut transit times necessary for food nutrients to absorb in the blood. So your food goes in, gets sucked up right away into your bloodstream. And it shortens the gut length needed to digest and absorb food nutrients. So you don't use your whole gut. And basically speeds the gut delivery of food nutrients and calories into the blood. I call it fast now fuels. Processed and refined food and beverage products that digest rapidly in the gut to deliver nutrients and calories quickly into the blood. Now, in our society of immediate gratification, I want it now. You drive through, boom, you get it. You want the taste right away in your mouth. You have all these chemical flavors. And then the food goes into your system and sucks up into your bloodstream. Boom, gives you sugar problems, cholesterol, and makes you gain weight. Fast now fuels mainline nutrients and calories into the blood, not healthy. Cancer cells feed first to survive and grow against immune system pressure. So obviously if you're pounding calories and nutrients into your bloodstream and you have a predisposition for cancer, you're gonna probably turn that predisposition on. In fact, when people can't eat and if they're in a hospital, we feed them through veins. People with cancer, if we feed them through the vein, their cancer grows faster, their lifespan shortens. Not good. Whole natural foods compared with processed foods require more mouth and gut work to break down and release bound food nutrients for blood delivery. You gotta work at it, right? Burn proportionally more calories to digest. It takes 10 to 20% of calories of what you've eaten just to break it down. You lose a lot of calories in the processing. They take longer to eat, digest, and deliver nutrients and calories from the gut into the blood and they traffic farther down the gut while being digested. Feeds your microbiome. Pass nutrients and calories more gradually into the blood. Slow later fuels, right? Whole natural foods that require longer to digest and deliver nutrients and calories into the blood. You can actually figure out using the water solubility test um, what the nutrient release uh, from prof, uh, process as opposed to whole foods is. When you throw processed food products into water, it disintegrates readily to release artificially combined nutrients soon after water immersion for only minutes or hours. A cookie dissolves right away. Pasta, if you leave it in water, disintegrates, right? Whole natural foods with naturally bound nutrients remain structurally intact after prolonged water immersion, sometimes for days or weeks. Throw an apple in the water. How long is it going to take to dissolve, right? Long time. 
Whole natural foods, how do you know what they are? The name is the ingredient. They're unprocessed, unrefined, and unadulterated foods as found in nature. What is the ingredient in an avocado? Avocado. Strawberries, strawberries, okay? Um, rice, rice. What's, what's um, processed foods have made up names with made up ingredients. What tree produced hot dogs? Don't know. Bread, pasta. You see, made up names that uh, don't source out bushes, ground, are processed foods. So eat foods where the name is the ingredient. They digest slowly and the gut release of nutrients and calories matches your body needs and utilization capacities. You have to have some semblance of nutritional morality, a code of conduct that guides your dietary behaviors and nutritional choices to maintain health and manage weight appropriately for you to stay healthy. If you have some semblance of nutritional morality, you can protect your nutritional well-being from corrupting influences out there, which includes commercial industries that are attempting to make you buy things. Now, nutritional morality doesn't mean you have to be completely devoid of some fun. It, nutritional morality recognizes entertainment from routine health maintenance, nutritional choices, right? So I tried to put together what are your needs based on my experience talking to people. Dr. Zarabowski's daily twos. Fruit daily, two servings minimum. This plant, hammer it down. Vegetables daily, two servings minimum. Plant. Whole natural grains daily, two servings minimum. Plant. Natural grains are quinoa, brown rice, right? Steel cut oats, these kinds of things. Not instant oatmeal, right? These are whole natural grains. Beans, legumes, nuts, or seeds, plant, these provide plant proteins and healthy fats. Daily, two servings uh, maximum. You don't want to eat too many nuts. There's a lot of dense calories in there, they're, but they're still plant. Milk and dairy, you need some calcium. Aged fermented cheeses and yogurt are lactose-free, for those of you that are lactose intolerant. Daily, two servings maximum. They're from the animal. Lean animal flesh from single animal sources. Okay, so... Avoid what I call community meats. A hot dog is community meat. Hamburgers are community meat, right? They ground up tons of cows to make hamburgers. Avoid processed and refined food and beverage products daily, too, completely. So what are healthy uh, human sizes? Okay, we're, all right, we're gonna stop right here. So Dr. Zarbelski's daily twos, and we're gonna take a break, part two. Okay. Um, so anyway, what are healthy human sizes? This has been looked at uh, across the board from many different angles. Basically, healthy human sizes maintain a balanced proportion between the supporting frame, your skeleton, working constituents, which are your organs and muscles, and non-working cargo fuel storage elements, which is fat. So basically, every frame has some maximal carrying capacity. You know, you can't put a thousand pounds on that table, it'll crush it. And the working constituents um, include all your organs, your brain, and then the fat that we carry. Uh, there is one, um, one um, attempt to find what is a healthy human size, and that's the body mass index. Nothing's perfect, okay? I gotta, tell you, science attempts to figure out where we should be with our sizes. And this is a calculated ratio that relates human mass, how much of you there is, to your height squared. So your mass is in kilograms divided by the height squared meters. And this correlates with health and longevity. So basically the way I liken this is there's so much of you, your mass, your, your, your skeleton, the fat, the, the muscles, etc. And then you got a certain height, which is your frame. If you take that height and you square it, you get a platform. So how much of you sits on that platform? The more of you on a certain platform, the more stress. If there's less of you, then you don't have enough components to uh, drive that platform to allow it to work. And in fact, a healthy BMI, that proportion is 18.5, between 18.5 to 24.9. You're underweight if you're less than 18.5. You're overweight if you're actually above, you're 25 uh, up to 30, 
Obesity is considered uh, a body mass index of 30. Morbid obesity is a body mass index of over 40. What does this mean? Well, when you start hitting the obesity uh, calculated body mass index, you start to shave years off your life, okay? You start to have health conditions, morbid obesity, you shave decades off your life. So obesity indicates a chronically overfueled body state having surplus calories stored excessively as fat. Obesity develops gradually over time when energy intake repeatedly exceeds body energy needs and utilization capacities. I always tell people, I can make you lose 50 pounds. I'm going to cut your leg off. And they go, well, okay, I don't want to lose it that way. Rapid weight loss may not necessarily be very healthy. Okay, rapid weight loss, when people get cancer and, you know, HIV and tuberculosis, they lose weight rapidly. So the body doesn't have a chance to adopt, adapt. So the body mass index predicts health and death risks. There are very few six foot tall, 100 pound individuals or five foot tall, 300 pound uh, individuals who are 80 years old. You just don't make it that far in life if you're underweight or overweight. So the BMI correlates with illness risk and premature death. There's this sweet spot, 18.5 to 24.9, that's the lowest risk. And as your BMI falls low, your risk increases. Um, as it goes up, here's obesity, uh, uh, risk increases. 40, you really increase your risk. So it's a calculated ratio. Another way of figuring out how big you should be is the ideal body weight, which is a calculated um, weight and that's used often in pharmacology for medication dosing and caloric re requirements. And it has to do with your lean body mass. It correlates with health risks too, but the ideal body weight calculations have limitations for short females and tall males. They just don't fit into this mold very well. But basically, as far as your uh, lean body mass, it's 106 pounds for the first five feet for males, plus six pounds per inch, plus or minus 10% uh, of weight based on frame size. Thin frame, 10% less, large frame, 10% more. Females are 100 pounds, less, uh, 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 they have less muscle mass, first five feet and five pounds per inch uh, above five feet. Another way of characterizing uh, human size or waist circumference, your abdominal girth. It increases your obesity risks when your abdominal waist circumference increases. So for men, um, obesity high risk is a uh, waist circumference of 40 inches and for women 35 inches. So for a certain overweight size or obese size, as your abdominal girth increases for that same BMI, your health risks increase, your death risks increase. Part of that reason is because the fat in your abdomen is very inflammatory. It's there for survival reasons. It's your body heater, but also provides a lot of energy for your heart, your liver to survive. And so uh, there's a theory on obesity where uh, the reason people develop abdominal obesity first is because that gets filled first for survival. So it fills that, um, we get uh, a visceral fat, abdominal obesity, and then the rest of us fill out. In fact, a lot of us will fill out the trunk first before anything else. What are our caloric energy needs? Well, daily energy requirements equal daily energy expenditures. Energy expenditures depend on your activity level. If you're just inactive and sedentary, you burn less than 25 kilocalories, you know, I want to add that K in there, per kilogram of ideal body weight. Fat isn't really, you know, it, it isn't really something that's burning energy. If you're moderately active, it's approximately 30 kilocalories per ideal body weight. And vigorous extreme activity, 30, over 35 kilocalories per ideal body weight. I've calculated this out to give you an idea what that means. Examples of daily and hourly energy needs. So if you're a five foot, 100 pound female, uh, sedentary, you're only burning 48 calories per hour. Moderate and vigorously active, 66 calories per hour. You're not burning that much energy. Going down to, um, if you're a taller female, you're still not burning that much energy, only 76 to 106 kilocalories per hour. A donut is 400 calories. 
Skip the donut. Skip the donut. You won't burn it. Even if you're vigorously active, it'll take you four hours. Don't do it. Resist. And if you're a male, it, it's not that much more. 84 to 118 kilocalories per hour as a range from sedentary to vigorously active. Skip eating the whole pizza. You'll need three days to burn it. Don't do it. If you're walking, it adds 200 calories per hour. If you're playing full court basketball for an hour, you will burn 1,000 calories. But how many of us are just running up and down the court? I'm not. Jogging 300 calories per hour, two donuts, jog for two hours. No way. Skip the donut. Caloric density. Eat less calorically dense foods. Thrifty genes. Some of us are even we're soft. We have thrifty genes. We're made to survive famine. I see this in a lot of um, Hispanic and Asian genetics. Okay? A donut to take six days to burn it off. Okay? So, and there are genetic components you inherit and epigenetic determinants. Remember, epigenetics is what activates your genes. Now, what about intermittent fasting and ketosis? <clears throat> your body needs a rest. Your cells need a rest from getting fueled all the time, right? You know, our behaviors in the world are recapitulated in our cells, okay? So if you had guests in your house all the time, partying 24-7, you'd go nuts. You'd burn down. Your brain and, you know, your physical body would break down. Intermittent fasting is an opportunity for your cells to clean up mess, clean house, repair, wear, and tear, refurbish, um, and to start burning fat. How long does it start, uh, take to burn fat? 12 to 14 hours. So that if you stop pounding your cells with any calories for 12 to 14 hours, you're gonna start burning fat in the cells. Okay, so intermittent fasting. You don't have to have a whole day of not eating anything. That's suffering. That makes me wanna eat, right? There are variations on a theme, but the bottom line is 12 to 14 hours, you can have water, tea, coffee, non-caloric drinks. Uh, but for the other uh, 10 to 12 hours, eat well. Eat those basics, the whole natural foods, where the name is the ingredient. So then you slowly deliver calories and you stay full. Remember, they fill your gut. You have good satiety if you're eating healthy, your gut is filled, you're not hungry. And then if you give yourself a break, you rebalance the way your system works. Insulin sensitivity increases, people start lowering their cholesterol levels, blood pressure goes down. You live longer. People who uh, engage in healthy diets and do intermittent fasting actually have longer lifespans. Movement. To be alive means to be moving. Death brings complete stillness. All right, as long as you're alive, you're moving in one way or another, right? Even when you're sleeping, what kinds of movements are there? Movements are activity. There's leisure, recreational, occupational, or work duty based, task or chore driven, you know, and there's regenerative or rest. When you're sleeping, you're still moving. Everything's moving, your enzymes, your blood's flowing, your heart's working. What's physical fitness? The ability to survive and successfully meet the physical challenges and demands within one's living environment and execute the activities of daily living with adequate endurance it means you can make it in the environment you live and you don't, you're not bushed. Fitness is about moving. If you want to get fit, you got to move. Fatness is about fueling. You're overfueled. You can't burn off rich foods easily. We have this thing called biological plasticity. We are uh, adaptable to physical or environmental stresses or applied forces through biological changes in shape or function. The more stress you put on our system, the more it adapts in various ways. And more commonly known as practice makes perfect, right? It is easier to maintain and regain, use it or lose it. You want to put good stresses on your body to make it be healthy. You don't want to put bad stresses so you adapt to damage. Fitness develops through regular physical activity. You gotta be active to develop fitness. The human body corporation, I like to see the body as a corporation. All body components function individually as franchises that serve one main body corporation. Your arms serve your 
corporation, your brain, everything. The body metabolically funds components according to productivity. As those franchises work, it gets more attention and energy. Redistributing biological capital from less to more active body components. What does that mean? Exercise tones and strengthens extremity and abdominal core muscles while shrinking abdominal and butt fat stores. If you sit on the butt, prolonged physical activity atrophies extremity and abdominal core muscles while increasing butt and abdominal fat stores. Plasticity, the stresses you put on your body, it will do either adapt to those stresses, it will get better, use that to your advantage. Metabolic levels of physical activity are based on calories burned. So if you're sedentary with little or no exercise, you burn less than 25 calories per kilogram per day, and I talked about this. Low activity is between 20 to 30 uh, calories per kilogram per day. That's light exercise or sports one to three days per week. Moderate activity is considered moderate exercise, sports three to uh, five days per week, and you burn more 31 to 35. If you're very active, very vigorous exercise, sports six to seven days per week, you'll burn a ton, 35 kilocalories per day. And again, some of you work very hard. You burn a lot of calories at work. You don't need to exercise, but the fact is, is how active are you? We also have a way of assessing physical activity based on uh, 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 intensity levels. Uh, uh, the physical activity intensity, intensity levels are based on your target heart rate for age. Your maximum heart rate is 220 minus your age. So if you're 100 years old, your um, heart rate maximally can beat at 120, that's it. So moderate intensity physical activity gets you to 50 to 75% of your maximal heart rate. So basically, if your heartbeat maximally is 120, 50% um, is 60 or 70. So if you're doing that, you're moderately intensely active. And, and your breathing will quicken without feeling breathless. You get light sweating after 10 minutes of activity, and you can converse but not sing. Vigorous physical activity gets your heart rate, maximal heart rate, 70, 85% of that. Breathing is rapid and, uh, is rapid and deep. <sighs> Moderate to heavy sweating occurs only after a few minutes and you feel too winded to talk in a full conversation. That's how we gauge things. Why is that important? Because we want to understand what uh, the Centers for Disease Control recommendations are for exercise. First of all, obtain a medical clearance before engaging in any vigorous exercise routines, then exercise under the care of a health care provider or physical activity specialist if you're elderly. Get clearance. Previously inactive or sedentary, so if you've just been hanging around for years, you need to make sure you don't have major health issues. If you do have health issues, you definitely have to be under the care. Heart, lung, kidney, liver, neurologic, orthopedic, metabolic uh, health disorders, et cetera, including diabetes, hypertension, or if you're pregnant, you need to be under the care of a health care provider. And you have to choose physical activities appropriate for your current fitness levels and health goals and increase physical activity levels, intensity, and duration gradually over time to meet key guidelines or health goals. Start low and go slow. Okay, we'll save questions to the end. We'll save the questions to the end, thank you. So in any case, start low and go slow. Uh, you know, if you haven't exercised, the worst thing to do is get into a very intense physical activity routine. You're going to come home limping, hurting, and in fact, you're probably not engaged in any more activity for the longest time. It's detrimental to your body. Let your body adapt. Use plasticity for your uh, benefit. CDC exercise guidelines for uh, adults. Move more and sit less throughout the day. Remember, I told you, three and a half hours, you're just blowing off time, not doing anything, sitting around. Exercise at least two and a half to five hours at moderate intensity, right? 50 to 75%, or, or geez, one and, one and a quarter hours or two and a half hours at vigorous intensity. Think about that. If you divide that up for seven days at 20, 15, 20 minutes a day, you just do things and you're going to be great weekly or some combination in between. It's not that much activity to get you physically fit. Spread the aerobic activity throughout the week. Don't do it all at one day. You know, you need to train your body, get it to adapt. Exercising for as short as 10-minute intervals adds up to provide health benefits. 
And in addition to the aerobic stuff, do muscle strengthening activities of moderate or greater intensity involving all major muscle groups on two or more days per week. Those are the CDC guidelines. Okay, they're available online. And if you're older, engage in multi-component physical activity that includes balance training. You don't want to fall. Fall is the number you know, one cause of problems as you get older. In fact, 20% of adults over the age of 60 or 70 fall once within the past year or so. Um, so you need to engage in multi-component activities. Balance the level of effort for physical activity relative to the level of fitness. If you're not that fit, do less. Build it up. Modify your activity levels according to your limitations imposed by any underlying chronic health conditions to do regular physical activity safely. Do it safely. Your body will eventually learn and train. Take your time. What are the benefits of exercise? We all kind of know. Fitness, strength, balance, endurance, increased energy level, improved emotional well-being. We feel good about ourselves and the world. Higher quality sleep, we sleep better. Easier weight control. Healthier gut microbiomes. Uh, People who exercise have healthier compositions, more rich and diverse microbiomes. They even like the exercise. You get better health and longer lifespan. You live longer. People who exercise actually live longer than people who don't exercise. Isn't that crazy? Gosh. Sleep and R&R, &R, that's the next stage, right? We've been through water. We've been through or air, water, fuel. Now we're on movement and sleep and R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. Rest and sleep provides R&R, &R. recharges and restores depleted energy, rebuilds and replaces worn out cells and cellular components. A lot of work gets done. Repair and regenerate deteriorated and injured tissues, reboot and reprogram body systems and operations, rejuvenate and revitalize your health and well-being. You need rest and sleep. Chronic sleep deprivation increases your stress levels and lowers your ability to handle stress. You're short fused, this clutters and disorganizes your thinking to reduce mental focus. I can't keep it straight. What, what is it again? What'd you tell me? Reduces mental sharpness and shortens attention span. Increases emotional liability and negative moods and attitudes. You know that from crabby kids. Put them to sleep. Reduces your motivation. I don't feel like doing anything if I haven't rested. Reduces brain cell signaling and information transfer on a biological scale. Reduces recall and learning capacity. Increases food cravings for junk food. If you're not rested, you're, you're suffering. You need some sweets. That'll give you more energy. No, actually, sleep will give you more energy. Increases risks for obesity and diabetes. Increases your risk for heart attack, strokes, and cancer. Lowers your immune resistance, and it shortens your lifespan. Get your sleep. Now, the benefits of sleep clears out accumulated biological wear and tear, cluttering brain cells, improves brain cell conductivity, communication, information processing, makes you think better, improves your cognitive performance, your attention span, learning and recall. Your negative thoughts go away after you've slept. Improves your mood, attitude, and emotional well-being. You're motivated, your energy's recharged, your performance increases, you can handle stress better. When in doubt, take a nap. How much sleep? Younger ages require more sleep than older. Your sleep quality is important. If you toss and turn, you're in a fit. Well, you're not getting good sleep. Individual sleep needs are actually determined genetically. Six to eight hours generally suffices for most adults, but seven to nine hours is optimal to re-energize for tackling life demands. There are many different studies that kind of came upon that. Some function adequately without adverse health consequences after only four to six hours of sleep. I mean, that's genetic. Okay, very few people do that. Naps up to 45 minutes during the day help temporarily restore depleted energy. If your energy's down, take a nap. How much uh, sleep tips? Establish a consistent bedtime, awake time. Prioritize sleep at bedtime. Sleep is for sleeping, not for watching TV, right? Get rid of the TV from the bedroom. Get rid of it. Eliminate negative thoughts and worries at bedtime, especially about having to fall asleep. Clear out your mind. Oh, I gotta go to sleep. I gotta let your mind go blank. Establish a bedtime routine to wind down and transition higher energy 
wakefulness into lower energy sleep state. All the lights are on. You can't just turn them off in your brain. So when you do MRI imaging of people awake and sleeping, the brain is turned on all around, glowing. When you're awake, very few places are on when you're sleeping. Create a comfortable sleep environment that's quiet, dark, and cool. Avoid eating larger meals within three hours before bedtime, which allows your stomach to empty. Discontinue using electronic devices and watching screens before bedtime. The blue light from electronic screens interferes with sleep. And if you've been doing that within a couple hours of sleep, you have a harder time falling asleep, harder time staying asleep, and you're not rested when you wake up in the morning. Avoid using caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol near bedtime. Avoid vigorous exercise before bedtime. Don't get your adrenaline level up, but you can do meditation or yoga, light stretching, relaxation exercises to relieve pent-up stress and reduce muscle tension, which will keep you from sleeping. Toxicity, right? Any detrimental force behavior activity that compromises normal physical or mental body functioning to create adverse consequences, disinfect disadvantageous to health, well-being, or survival. Toxicity comes in many forms, shapes, and flavors. Toxicity chem uh, category, chemical, right? Various chemicals we inject or, or ingest or expose to the environment. Physical, you get punched, you fall, okay? So it's, a car runs you over, toxicity. Biological infections. Thermal radiation, we all know that radiation causes cancer and kills you. If you Jump in a fire, it's toxicity. Emotional toxicity, or sometimes surrounded by circumstances or individuals that stress us out. They're toxic, they jam our brain waves, they create stress. Neglect or deficiency, that's toxicity. I didn't get it done, I didn't fix it. Okay, I didn't eat, I'm hungry, I'm toxic now, I have to figure out how to exist. Toxicity injur injuries promote maladaptive compensatory health responses. So our bodies try to mitigate. You know, the first time people start smoking, they cough, and hey, the body's going like, hey, hey, smoke is toxic. And uh, no, I'm going to learn to smoke. Okay, eventually your brain goes like, shuts off. It just adapts to that. And predisposed to repair injuries. So now you're smoking, you're causing damage. Your body is adapted to that, trying to make it keep you alive, but you're creating scarring and injury. You're reducing the lifespan of specific organ systems by, uh, through the toxicity. Common sources of chemical toxicity, processed and refined food and beverage products, right? They have all kinds of things in there. Vitamins and health supplements, believe it or not. Both the active ingredient and inactive filler casing coating ingredients. Taking too many vitamins, they're chemicals. All the fillers, they're inactive. They're hitchhikers that toxify the body. We only need a certain amount of vitamins. Jeez, if you eat a healthy diet, getting all your vitamins and minerals, why do you need supplements? On the other hand, if you eat a really bad diet, then is the solution taking supplements? No, change your diet. Eat better, make better choices. Medications, both the on-target and off-target effects, create toxicity. We actually poison enzyme systems when we take medicines to stop what they're doing. High blood pressure, your, your body's reacting to too many calories with high blood pressure. We poison it, we say, you can't do that. We don't fix it, we antidote that toxic behavior. Okay, and then off-target uh, effects, side effects. Oh, I'm taking this medicine and I got this rash. Alcohol, you know, what needs to be said? It causes cancer in human beings, tobacco products, recreational drugs. What's the purpose of recreational drugs? Not to make you healthy, but to get high. Let's just get high. I'm going to do this stuff. I'm going to get wasted. All right. I'm going to toxify my normal brain function. Burn foods. As you burn foods, that create cancer-causing substances. Hygiene and beauty products. We inhale them, swallow them, and inadvertently they're absorbed through our skin. They poison our body. They go into our system. Cleaners and sanitizers. You know. We sterilize everything. It's, it's poisoning bacteria. Guess what? We have bacteria inside of us. We're poisoning that. And occupational, many of us may work in environments that are poisonous. Particularly, the artificial food and beverage uh, processing causes a lot of toxicities because first we get the toxicities that come from the environment, farming, livestock, and poultry uh, procurement contaminants. You know, the environment got into our livestock. They gave it hormones, blah, blah. 
food deconstruction and processing subtractions and losses. So whether it's GMOs or, you know, when the food is broken down, that creates various potential for toxicities, too much sugar, too much fat, it's missing this, it's deficiencies. Food additions, preservatives and additives to prolong shelf life or enhance appearance, smell, taste, palatability, or nutritional value. None of the food additions, they're chemicals, they're not foods. Our body has to detoxify, get them out through the kidneys or liver. Manufacturing processes uh, uh, create contaminations in the vats. How do they clean the vats? What was used to scrub? Are they clean? You know, the processing, transiting, the conveyor belts, the transport contaminations get into the food, artificial food and beverage processing, packaging, wrappers and containers cause contamination. There's many examples of that. They're, they're, for, they're called forever chemicals in our water supply. They get into our body and they change our hormone structure, our health. Common International Agency of Research Cancer Known Human Carcinogens. You want to avoid, you know, lower your risk of cancer? Tobacco products, number one, cause cancer. Alcohol products, number one, level one, carcinogen. Processed and smoked meats and salted fish. Burned foods, air pollution and asbestos. Coal and coal tar emissions. Numerous chemotherapy agents, they're poisons, and they also cause cancer because they cause genetic disruptions. Radiation, radiation emitting substances, workplace exposures to chemicals and metals used in painting, welding, aluminum production, furniture, rubber, glass, steel, electronics, and le leather manufacturing. There's a lot of stuff that people are exposed to and they cause cancer and viral infections and worm infestations. Next and final is the human connection. Humans are social beings who are all in it together. We're here together. The human species perpetuates through reproductive actions involving biological coupling. You need two to tangle. We don't divide like some worms and, you know, cells. You need other humans. Humans would become extinct in one human lifetime if they were segregated completely according to biological sex. And we're not talking about in vitro fertilization and all this. I'm talking about, you know, doing it the real way, biological way, okay? All human civilization accomplishments occur through the combined efforts of many. We get places by working together. Our strengths, humanity's strengths exist in numbers. We got to work together. If we were attacked by aliens, would we um, seek the help of animals and... Uh, fish, or will we say, hey, we got to get together and work on this and survive the aliens, okay? Individualized perspectives developed through experiences and learning involving many. So your view of the world is based on your existence with other people. Hum humans exist fashioning singular viewpoints. Humanity exists by consolidating singular viewpoints. So, Individuals understand the world based on individual experiences and perspectives. Humanity advances by combining and building upon individual human understandings. So in order for us to move forward, we need to work together. Human connectivity establishes and cultivates human relationships, creates social ties, builds support systems for us, gives us a sense of belonging, develops a sense of identity, who we are, based on where we are, improves personal health and well-being, we're healthier, connecting, extends our lifespan, we live longer, and provides understanding to give life meaning. We know why we're here. Connectivity, what's the best way? The most gratifying is intimate, personal, engaging all senses and attention and unconditional. Here we are using the senses, talking to each other, that's the best. Now all of a sudden you interpose electronic gadgetry. You interpose all these things, you start to whittle away the most gratifying uh, uh, connectivity, and it becomes less and least satisfying is restricted, limited in scope, and personal, devoid of physical engagement of the senses. So when you interpose electronic uh, gizmos between our connection, we're controlled. It becomes an electronic leash that tells us what to do, how to do it. Uh, we're not there to connect and understand each other on the same level. We're losing that. Human connection requires effective communication. You have to engage all available senses. You have to actually look at somebody and listen to them and listen intently with interest. 
you know, you actually have to engage your senses. React appropriately with respect when they say something. You don't punch them in the face. You go, okay, I, you have your own perspective in life. I get it. I get it. You're coming from a different place than me. I have different interests. Remember, feed and breed with greed. Oh, my God. And my feed and breed with greed don't coordinate with your feed and breed with greed. So, you know, we have to respond thoughtfully with understanding. I get it. Okay, you're coming from this, but this is how I feel, right? Deficient or absent human connections is, excludes participation in humanity and human affairs. You're not part of it. Limits human experiences in life perspective. You don't see it. You don't understand. It reduces human empathy and understanding. You don't care. You're like, I don't get it. I'm not there. Increases personal stresses. You're more stressed out. You have nobody to talk to. Increases your health risk and reduces your lifespan. Remember, this is about health. Connection tips. Take initiative to reach out and connect with others. Develop an interest in human affairs. Okay? Get involved in meaningful causes to help others. Do something. Do something that's going to make other people's lives better. They feel better. Remember that positive, constructive, you know, build something. You don't have to build the Taj Mahal. You can build a relationship. You can help somebody in their lives. Work to make a positive life difference daily. Do something positive every day. Be a friend to have a friend, right? Your mental health. Healthier living produces healthier minds. Dietary and lifestyle choices greatly affect dementia and depression risks. So when you're older, it's very important not to restrict your consumption of whole natural foods because they diversify your microbiome. That has an impact on your mental health well-being. Your physical activity is very important. That gets your brain um, activated, uh, you know, doing, doing things that are intellectually challenging. Stay active. Use that time you have available to be more human, uh, living, doing the basics that keep your, the fundamental basics. Think healthy, act healthy, live healthy, right? That's what it's about. Choose better to live better, right? And it should be predicated on healthier choices. Now, this is time for the audience handout, okay? Hold your hand out. Fundamental human needs for existence. Number one, air. Keep it clean. Two is water. Pure water, H2O. Number three, fuel. Should be mother nature made, whole natural foods. Four, movement. You should move daily with every opportunity. Five, rest. Should be high quality and adequate to recover, regenerate. Six, toxicity avoidance of your health. Uh, uh, you know, uh, from, from various angles, right? Avoid toxicity. And finally, human connection. Here's you, here's somebody else. Always with concern, respect, and understanding toward others. Thank you very much. Any questions?